Let me begin with this. Um, even though I, I was not academically inclined till after I came to Christ and actually um, had the influence of Lewis's writings in my life, I always had a love affair with words. I remember the first time I ever fell in love with a word. It was in first grade. Mrs. Reinhardt, our teacher, was going through flashcards for vocabulary buildup. And it was the word swish. It was my first favorite word. I still love that onomatopoeic word, and I fell in love with it long before it was popularized by a clean shot in basketball. Pokey was another word I liked at that time. Um, I love the words ambiguity, perplexed, and subtle. And I can see the very moments when I first heard those words, or the word ostentatious, which is a word too ostentatious for my vocabulary. But there's a word I have in mind. I grew up, as I mentioned, in South Central Los Angeles. I would see the kids going to uh, the cafeteria at my elementary school. I longed to know what that world was like, but it cost 31 cents to go to cafeteria, and that was prohibitive for us. My mother always made us a lunch with a sandwich and a piece of fruit and a couple cookies, and we always had something to eat, but I, I didn't know what cafeteria life was like. And one day in third grade, to my complete surprise, my mother handed me 31 cents when I left the house, and she said, you can eat in the cafeteria today. I was worried I might lose the money, so all during the day before cafeteria, I kept grabbing my pocket to make sure that money was still there. And I went into the cafeteria, and though I couldn't have described it this way then, these were my feelings. That being unfamiliar with the sociological protocols of cafeteria life, I might do something utterly stupid and counter to the culture, and everybody would make fun of me. So I gave the lady at the cash register my 31 cents and was relieved to do so. And I watched the girl in front of me with intensity she grabbed her fiberglass tray, I did as she did. She put her knife, fork, and spoon on the tray, I did as she did her napkin as well. I moved that tray to that chrome roll bar counter. Do you remember that chrome roll bar counter in uh, elementary school? And the first item that was on the uh, uh, menu were string beans. I hated string beans. <laughs> and I thought this cafeteria life wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Apparently, the girl in front of me didn't like them very well either because she said, I'll have a small portion of those, please. I'd never heard the word portion before in my life. I watched with intensity as a cafeteria lady. Do you remember her? She was kind of a large woman, and she had gray hair and a hairnet, and she had a white outfit on with a white apron with lots of smudge marks on it. She was the ubiquitous cafeteria lady who worked in every elementary school cafeteria in America. The girl said, I'll have a small portion of those, uh, please. And the woman turned around, grabbed a little bowl, grabbed a huge spoon with holes in it so the juices could go through. She dug deep down into a pot, put three string beans in the bowl. And I said to the cafeteria lady, I'll have a small portion of those too, please. And she did the same thing for me. I went on down the line, and I put different things on my tray. And when I got to the end, remember that's where the desserts were, I saw the most economically cut pieces of chocolate cake I'd ever seen in my world, and I wondered if that word had other applications. So I said to the cafeteria lady, I'll have a large portion of that, please. <laughs> and she cut me the biggest piece of chocolate cake I'd ever seen in my life, and I thought to myself, that is a good word. <laughs> the psalmist says, whom have I in heaven but thee? And besides thee, I desire nothing on earth. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I don't want a bigger portion of C.S. Lewis. I want a bigger portion of God. But the one thing that will cause me to have a diminished portion of God is if I have a swollen portion of myself. In the letters, one of the most dominant themes running through the screw tape letters are screw tape trying to woo his patient through wormwood into this swollen sense of self and to pride. And I want us then to unpackage this. There's 31 letters that comprise C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters. Of these, each letter contains approximately one to three themes. Some of these themes, such as pride, the rationalization of evil, we already called it acrasia in one of the earlier lectures, 
and the temptations of the flesh occur with great frequency, and those are the three themes I want to unpackage. And it's due to the frequency of these themes that I'll d devote these next lectures to these topics. The first of these topics, as I mentioned, is pride. A swollen sense of self, which makes me less and less dependent upon God and have a diminished view of him. Pride, basically, is man trying to play God of his own life. Every definition of sin in the Bible has this as the dominant concept embedded in what it means to sin. In Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Greek word for sin, hamartia, from which the theological doctrine of sin, hamartiology, comes, was an archer's term. If the archer took an arrow from his quiver, knocked the arrow in the bow, and shot it at the target, if the arrow fell short of the mark, it was called a hamartia. For all have sinned and fallen short of what mark? The glory of God. We've assumed a position we were unqualified for. And that's basically what sin is. The sins are a resulting consequence of our mismanagement of our own lives once we've abandoned God's right to rule and reign over them. God knows that we are having a diminished experience as human beings if we are estranged from him. He seeks to woo us back. Screwtape wants us to be as estranged as possible forever if he would have his way. In 1 John 3, 4, it says that sin is lawlessness. Sin is not antinomian against the law. Sin in that passage in the Greek is anomos. It's without law. It is anarchistic, deriving its own standards from itself. It plays God and spins its own morality out from self like a spider spinning its web. In Genesis, as Satan tempts Eve, he appeals to her by telling her that eating the fruit will allow her to be like God in Genesis 3.5. Similarly, pride, as Lewis defined it in Mere Christianity, is self-conceit. It's the opposite of humility. It is the essential vice, Lewis says, leading to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Now, how we get to pride, we'll look at in the uh, last lecture that we have, uh, as we look at the antidote to Screwtape's advice. I think uh, pride is at the end of a process. It's not the beginning of the process, but we'll talk more about that later. Um, it is essential vice leading to every other vice. It is a complete anti-God state of mind. Lewis concludes his chapter on pride with these words. If anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I, can, I think, tell him the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud. And we'll encounter that realization in the mirror of screw tape letters as Lewis holds it up to us. He says it's a biggish step, too. At least nothing whatever can be done before it. If you think you are not conceited, it means you're very conceited indeed. And this hints at Screwtape's strategy to keep a person proud and not to allow the slightest hint of real humility to begin to emerge. Let us look through the letters listed and let us see if we can find various nuances and subtleties of pride as Lewis discusses them. Pride, as we've already noted, um, and, and Screwtape's desire, the hellish experience, is to deny reality and put uh, self in God's place. After that, everything is a projection or a deployment of what we've already described as the transforming imagination. So Screwtape seeks to take good things and corrupt them with pride, even humility, even prayer, even the church. Lewis uh, <clears throat> allows Screwtape to write this to Wormwood. Your patient has become humble in letter number 14. Have you drawn his attention to the fact? All virtues are less formidable to us, Screwtape writes, once the man is aware that he has them. But this is especially true of humility. Screwtape is not creative. He takes the good thing and perverts it. Lewis says all evil is a perversion of good. You can't think of a, of a good banana, a bad banana, excuse me, without thinking of a good banana that went bad. Evil compares to good like bread mold compares to bread. It feeds on the original thing. But even man made in the image of a creator can take bread mold and make penicillin from it, something good out of something bad. 
And so, too, God could take the worst of evil events, as he demonstrated at Calvary, and make of it divine penicillin and the ultimate healing medicine for the worst ailment of all, our sin and our pride. Pride is self-centered and self-exalting, and as such estranges us from the real world where God and others can be met. It engages in projection of self and self-interest onto the world around us and thereby becomes utilitarian. Pride results in attempts to actually alter reality, and this is seen in Screwtape's advice relative to humility. Screwtape says again in letter 14, conceal from the patient the true end of humility. He doesn't want him to see that humility leads to God. Instead, he says, let him think of it not as self-forgetfulness, but as a certain kind of opinion, namely a low opinion of himself, of his own talents and characters. In other words, false humility is dishonest. It's dishonest about others, and it's dishonest about ourselves. Make him value an opinion for some other quality than truth, thus introducing an element of dishonesty and make believe into the heart of what otherwise threatens to become a virtue. And since what they are trying to believe may in some cases be manifest nonsense, they cannot succeed in believing it, and we have a chance of keeping their minds endlessly revolving on themselves in an effort to achieve the impossible. I, I remember once being at a church potluck, and this woman started talking about this one dessert that was on the table. She says, that is the best banana cream pie I've ever tasted. It is so wonderful. And she went on and on about it. And somebody said, oh, do you know who made it? And the woman said, I did. <laughs> it was good pie. To acknowledge the truth was an act of humility. It wasn't arrogant. It was, I tasted it. It really was good pie. Humility is not running yourself down. Humility is a synonym for honesty. Humility is the willingness to adjust the scoliosis of our thinking to the plumb line of reality. And if reality says this is good, we acknowledge it. And it may even be some good that we, by the grace of God, were able to do. The enemy wants him, in the end, Screwtape writes, to be so free from any bias in his own favor that he can rejoice in his own talents as frankly and gratefully as in his neighbor's talents, or in a surprise, or in an elephant, or in a waterfall. He wants each man in the long run to be able to recognize all creatures, even himself, as glorious, excellent things. True humility cultivates eyes that see God's purposes unfold in his creation, how each is made, how each has uniqueness in order to serve God and others. But each of us is intolerant of pride when we see it in others, of course, but a false humility is manifest in our blindness to pride in our own lives every time it raises its ugly head. Um, there's a famous story of Muhammad Ali, arguably the greatest fighter in American history. And he was on an airplane. And the flight attendant came by and said, please fasten your seatbelt, Mr. Ali. And he said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And she said, no, and Superman don't need no airplane either. Please fasten your seatbelt, <laughs> Mr. Ali. T.E. Lawrence, better known as Lawrence of Arabia, was one of the great academics at Oxford University. He was a fellow at All Souls. They have no undergraduate students there. It's just researchers. He was steeped in his understanding of classical languages, Middle Eastern languages as well as uh, the European languages. He became a soldier in World War I, and, and you know the story about Lawrence. After the war was over, he sought anonymity, and so he took a pseudonym and became a mere RAF airman. He could have gone back to Oxford University. He had a position waiting for him, but he just tried to get away from it all. He was a friend of Thomas Hardy and Mrs. Hardy, and Mrs. Hardy had invited him over for tea one time, and the mayoress of Dorchester happened to be there as uh, Lawrence pulled up on his motorcycle in his mere airman's uniform. The mayoress of Dorchester was of uh, upper-class sentiments, and she looks at uh, T.E. Lawrence, and she says in French to Mrs. Hardy, I find it offensive to take tea with a mere airman. There was an awkward pause. And then Lawrence said in flawless French to the mayor of Dorchester, it appears Mrs. Hardy doesn't speak French. May I translate for you? 
All of us find pride offensive whenever we encounter it. But often we miss it completely in ourselves. And at no time has screw tape got his hooks in us better than when that occurs. Because we start operating by a double standard. And some blindness sets in. There was a famous Milgram experiment at Yale University. The Nazi war trials were occurring. And many of the Nazi officers said we were just doing what our officers commanded us to do. And the Western world was incensed by this excuse. And Milgram wondered how would people do under particular pressure. So in this particular experiment, he had uh, people who would be paid a fee to come in and, and work, and they would run a switchboard. There would be a man who would be in charge of the experiment. On the other side of a, of, of a curtain, there would be somebody asking questions of another person. Simple questions. Who was the first president of the United States? Something like this. If they said Thomas Jefferson, the person running the experiment would say, give him a one. There was a board that had numbers one through 10. One, he would flip the one switch, and this person on the other side of the screen would uh, uh, exhibit the displeasure and the pain by a mild cry. Ow! The switchboard that the person who was being paid to do this, the volunteer, so to speak, uh, went from mild discomfort to fatal. As the questions became more complex and the person would answer them, the instructor would say, give them a seven. And you would hear the excruciating pain of the person on the other side. Sometimes the person running the switchboard would say, it's, it, it's painful for him. I don't know if I should do this. He'd say, just do it. It's okay. I'll assume full responsibility. The person who was being experimented on was the person at the switchboard. They were actors on the other side of the screen. And they wanted to see how far a person would be willing to go. The experiment wasn't over once they tabulated the results. They went into the classrooms and talked to the normal students at Yale University. They explained what they did in the experiment and said, how many of you could see yourself throwing the fatal switch. 99% of the students said they would never do it. Only 1% had enough self-doubt to say they could see that they might. And yet in the experiment, 70% of the people who sat at the switchboard threw the fatal switch. We tend to have inflated estimates of ourselves. And consequently, we engage in the transforming imagination. We project on things that we're better than we really are. Humility escapes us. I was on a camping trip once. I wasn't born with a sense of smell. And one of the guys on the camping trip got sprayed by a skunk. I was the only one that could have conversations with him. Didn't bother me a bit. I didn't have a clue. But it wasn't long before that friend of mine, Mark, became acclimated to the smell. And screw tape likes us to be acclimated to the smell of pride as it exhibits itself in our lives. Screwtape also advises in letter 17, keep your man in the condition of false spirituality. In this regard, pride becomes a religious condition, albeit a very unsavory one. In letter four, pride transforms prayer into idolatry. It appears from this letter that Wormwood's patient, Wormwood's patient, has begun the practice of prayer, and Screwtape warns Wormwood that he must not allow prayer to God, but rather to the patient's image of God, made up from a compos compo composite of a host of contributing factors. Whatever the case may be, the image is wrong and projective. In essence, Screwtape advises Wormwood to have his patient pray to the God of his own making. This, of course, makes the patient a God of his own God and thus a worshiper of a God of his own making. And here pride is cultivated even in the midst of what first appears to be a spiritual discipline, when in fact the discipline only reinforces the bad activity. And Dr. Richard Chase, former president of Wheaton College, used to say, practice doesn't make perfect, it only makes permanent. In essence, Screwtape is advising Wormwood to tempt his patient to idolatry, to embrace a deity destined to calcify, become brittle and break, this runs against the grain of Lewis, who would often write, I want God, not my idea of God. I want my neighbor, not my idea of my neighbor. I want my spouse, not my idea of my spouse. I want myself, not my idea of myself. 
One could easily play this out further by imagining that the subtle act of creating one's own God can also provide ample reasons for being disappointed at that God and then projecting the disappointment on the Christian God. I wonder if sometimes some of the rejection that people have, even some of the new atheism, if some of that rejection is a rejection of a God they made in their own image, we would say in an informal fallacy, it's a straw man argument. Screwtape says the best thing when your patient has begun to pray, the best thing where it is possible is to keep the patient from serious intention of praying altogether. He says, it's funny how mortals always picture us as putting things into their minds. In reality, our best work is done by keeping things out. The next word of advice in this letter, four, is Screwtape says, misdirect his attention if you can't keep him from praying. And the simplest way to do this is to turn the person's gaze away from him, uh, 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 away from God, towards themselves. Screwtape warns Wormwood that it is risky business nonetheless, for God responds to prayers even when the motives of men and women are not perfect. This is really a, a great thing. Um, I, I am under the impression that we're all pea brains. You go to Barnes and Noble. Have you read all those books? We're making judgments all the time, and we know so little. You go to the Bodleian Library at Oxford University, there's about 135 miles of shelf space of books at that library. You fill out a reader's ticket, and you turn it in, and they pride themselves that in 24 hours they could have the book for you to read. Who's read all those books? But we're making judgments all the time. We just don't know very much. And when we think we do, Screwtape has his way with us. Um, we can know some things. A tree doesn't have to give up its interior rings, C.S. Lewis says, if it adds more rings. But if it's not adding more rings, it's dead. We need to have a robust understanding of things, but we also recognize in that process that we don't know very much. Our moral lives are not perfect. We don't have it all together. Have you ever had a perfectly pure motive for anything you've ever done? If you think we, you have, we're going to have a prayer meeting up here for you afterwards. Um, nobody is very life-skilled. Nobody's ever ready to get married. Nobody's ever ready to have children. If we waited till we were, the whole universe would end this generation. We operate at a level of awkwardness. A toddler learning to walk falls down and gets bruised. A six-year-old taking the training wheel off the bicycle ends up getting abrasions to match those bruises. And an adolescent picking up a uh, skateboard and learning how to skateboard, learning how to ollie or how to use the half pipe will sprain an ankle or break a wrist. All of us at some level are awkward. As a matter of fact, if you're not awkward someplace in your life, you're just not growing. We can't wait till we have it all together before we engage in these things, our motives being perfect, our skills being perfect, and so on. Misdirect their attention that they have to have it all together before they do things. Finally, Screwtape advises Wormwood to have his patient pray to images in his mind as if these were God. This is an old idea. Lewis wrote in the first book he wrote after he was a Christian, first explicitly Christian book, he wrote, all prayers always taken at their word blaspheme invoking with frail imageries of folklore dream. And all men are idolaters, crying unheard to senseless idols, if thou take them at their word. God is a person who takes our prayers, fumbling as they may be, and diverts them to himself, and receives them as they are. But Satan says, keep him distracted. Make even his prayers a place of corruption and pride. In letter 16, Screwtape writes to Wormwood and says, let pride transform his image of the church into worship of self. Screwtape writes, surely you know that if a man can't be cured of church going, the next best thing is to send him all over the neighborhood looking for a church that suits him until he becomes a taster or connoisseur of churches. <laughs> the search for a suitable church makes the man a critic where the enemy wants him to be a pupil. Screwtape writes, Lewis didn't like hymns, at least church hymns. And he said he would sometimes go to church and he would see the butcher singing the hymns loudly. 
And he'd say, what does that butcher know about music? And Screwtape was having his way with Lewis. And Lewis started thinking more about it as he sat in the service, and the Holy Spirit would convict his heart. And he would say, you know what? I'm not even worthy to polish the boots of that butcher. That's moving in the right direction. But as long as we become a connoisseur of these things, we're in trouble. I remember years ago when I pastored, there was a man who came up to me, and he said, I don't like the music at this church. I want to sing the old hymns of the faith. He wasn't a bad man, but he had hot tears in his eyes, and he was angry. And I said, what do you mean about the old hymns? What are you thinking of? When you think of the old hymns of the faith, are you thinking of the hymns that you loved to sing when you were young? Because if that's the case, certainly you're not operating by a double standard, and you'd prevent these young people from singing the hymns they like. Or when you mean the old hymns of the faith, you mean the revival hymns of Homer Rhoda Heaver and P.P. Bliss and Fanny Crosby. Or when you say the old hymns of the faith, do you mean the pietistic hymns of uh, John and Charles Wesley and Isaac Watts? Or when you say the old hymns, do you mean the hymns from the Witten, Wittenberg Gesang book or, or the hymns of Martin Luther or the hymns of, of uh, Philip Melanchthon? Or when you say the old hymns of the faith, do you mean the Gregorian chants? What do you mean by old hymns of the faith? And he was clueless. He didn't know. He thought the music and worship was about him. And you know what else? I was way too hard on that man way too hard on that man. And all of us at that point are right where screw tape wants wormwood to get us. And we can even make our going to church a place where we miss out on what God wants to do in us and through us at that place. Screw tape endorses two kinds of churches. He writes and he endorses the vicar who waters down scripture and its doctrines. This type of church is amorphic and leaves the attendee free to make his religion into anything he wants it to be. But there could also be the vicar who uses scripture through which to breathe his own opinions. And of course, this type of church makes the word of its pastors and parishioners equal to the word of God. In the screw tape letters, Lewis warns there's two kinds of evil people. Excuse me, the worst of evil people, he says, are religious evil people. And, and the quicker he says, I'm willing to die for my faith, maybe the quicker I'd be willing to kill for my faith. We've all seen that kind of religious zeal before. But also there's the possibility, second kind, is the person who paints the thus saith the Lord across their own uh, words or opinions. And that's the person who's in the predicament that Ezekiel the prophet writes about when he says the false prophets say, thus saith the Lord when the Lord hath not said. Or as a friend of mine said, they say of their own opinions, my way is Yahweh. It's very dangerous. <laughs> Screw tape advises to keep the patient in a party church where he can join a party that rejects others without reason, simply dismissing others because they're not affiliated with the right party. He writes in letter 17, keep your man in a condition of false spirituality. In letter 8, we see the pride that transforms expectations and maintains falsely that spiritual life is always even keeled. Lewis writes about, uh, has screw tape write about the fact that men and women go through what he calls uh, the laws of undulation. We have our peaks and our troughs. We have our glorious moments when we're encouraged and we feel like we could fly through life. And we have the troughs when we feel like we're walking, uh, trudging through quicksand. What John of the Cross called the dark night of the soul. But pride directs a man or a woman to interpret reality from the perspective of the current peak or the descending trough. And such a perspective makes man the center of his world. Rather than peaks leading to worship and troughs leading to perseverance, these are good things, Screw tape is saying, let him think that he should have the expectation everything should be smooth sailing. And then when the disappointments come, let that draw him away from God because he wants his idea of God and not God. Such false expectation and projection is destined to disappoint. In an essay called Talking About Bicycles and Present Concerns, Lewis wrote about the fact that there's four phases of enchantment. The first is to be unenchanted. Nothing is awakened in me desire. 
The second is to be enchanted. I have my moment where all of a sudden my heart is soaring in its quest for God. But then the thing that awakened desire, as I've tethered my heart to it, cannot satisfy that desire, and it leads to the third phase of enchantment, which is disenchantment. If I vector away at that point, screw tape has had his way with me. I need to persevere till I come to the place of re-enchantment and I find out the things that cause the ups and downs are not what I want most. I want the steady relationship with God. And the relationship with God that I can find in the Job-like moments and the relationship I can find with God in the joy-like moments. Um, pride could transform corporate worship into systemic evil. Lewis writes about that in letter 10. In letter 21, he writes about pride transforming uh, into the judgment of the motives of other people. All judgments imply a standard. But if I've vectored away from any true standard, then I become very self-referential, which is one of the great expressions of pride. Self-referential. Um, Lewis writes about it this way, where Screwtape says, let them be offended by stolen time as if the person they're in relationship with is stealing their time, ripping them off, uh, inconveniencing them knowingly. Build in your person, screw tape says, a sense that my time is my own. It's similar to the gluttony of de delicacy, all I, the all I want state of mind, he writes about in letter 21. All she wants is a cup of tea properly made, or an egg properly boiled, or a slice of bread properly to toasted. But she never finds any servant or any friend who can do these things properly because her properly conceals an insatiable, insatiable demand for the exact and almost impossible palatable pleasures for which she imagines she remembers from the past, and which, of course, she couldn't produce for anybody else either. There's the double standard. The daily disappointment produces daily ill temper. Screwtape writes, the sense of ownership in general is always to be encouraged. The humans are always putting up claims to ownership. Screwtape says, we produce this sense of ownership not only by pride, but by confusion. We teach them not to notice the different senses of the possessive pronoun, the finely graded differences that run from my boots through my dog, my servant, my wife, my father, my master, and my country to my God. They can be taught to reduce all these senses to that of my boots, the my of ownership. And there's where the arrogance and the utilitarian tendencies that follow self-referentialism begin to appear. These ideas reverberate throughout C.S. Lewis. They reverberate. He cites in Dante's De Monarchia uh, that the essence exists for the sake of function. Um, when, when, when Dante wrote the essence exists for the sake of function, he's saying that what God created me to be was created for purposes that God was assigning to me. We see it even in the beginning of creation where God makes the light, but after he makes the light, he makes the illuminaries, the sun, the moon, and stars. He makes the essences to fulfill the function, but the function precedes the essence. God made each of us for particular purposes. Essence exists for the sake of function. The fall occurs when I say, I will assert my will over God's and I will prescribe to myself my purpose and function. And I'm in disharmony with God. When Lewis wrote the Arthurian Torso, a literary criticism of his friend Charles Williams' Arthurian poetry, Lewis says that all of Camelot begins to fall apart when King Arthur comes on the scene asking this question, does the king exist for the kingdom? or the kingdom for the king. And at that moment, everything falls apart. The irony, Screwtape observes, is this. In the long run, either our father, meaning Satan, or the enemy, meaning God, will say, mine. Of each thing that exists, and especially of each man, Screwtape continues, at present, the enemy says, mine of everything, on the pedantic legalistic ground that he made it. But of course, that is the ground. Screwtape writes, men are not angered by mere misfortune, 
but by misfortune conceived is injury because their swollen sense of self has been offended. In essence, in pride, we see things matter if and only if they matter to me. This sets me in conflict with the rest of the world. And if it sets me in conflict with the rest of the world, it has to be rationalized. And what we will see in our first lecture tomorrow is the idea of acrasia or rationalization of evil act as Lewis uh, strings that thread through the screw tape letters.